There we go, recording now. Um, this is one of my favorite days uh, with having type one diabetes. I just love hearing from my fellow people with diabetes and just having these conversations. I think the community is so strong and community support is just so um, needed. And so I'm excited for these sessions today. Um, I will go ahead and pass this over to Kai. So this session today is about adulting and diabetes. Um, I will, yeah, just hand it over to Kai. She is the moderator and she will introduce everyone and get it going. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for being here. I am Kai Moon. I am founder of Black Diabetic Girl and Dope Diabetic Girls and Girl Chat. And I am here with three amazing people who I would let them tell you just a little bit about their stuff. And then we're going to get into some good stuff. We're going to get into some good conversation here about adulting and living with diabetes. So I'm going to do it backwards here. I know normally we let the ladies go first, but Matt is outnumbered. So what's gonna let Matt kick us off today? Kai, thank, thanks. My name is Matt Tarrow. I've been living with type one diabetes for 20 years. Did you just want me to talk and say hi? Is that what you want me to do? <laughs> okay. Oh, you want? They need to know. They might not know who you are, Matt. So I, I live in I live in Denver, Colorado. I just moved out here six months ago. I was living in San Diego, California before that, in Los Angeles. And um, I started Bolus Maximus. Bolus Maximus with Brandon A. Denson. Uh, he's on another panel, but um, we decided that men needed a safer place to communicate. And not only that, get information and feel like there was safe spaces for men to, to interact and then open up and try to destigmatize that not wanting to talk about diabetes or life. So um, we do that, I'm a, I'm a professional photographer and artist. Uh, yeah, and it's super excited to be here. Thank you, Kai. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. And if you guys have not checked out Bonus Maximum, please do. Next, Miss Mariah. Good morning. Uh, Mariah Rankin Landers. I am here in California on Miwok land. And I um, have been living with diabetes for 35 years, and I work in the arts and education field. Um, I've been a former kindergarten teacher in my life and also a bridge builder. Um, a lot of my, I spent a lot of time at summer camp, uh, Bearskin Meadow, and was a bridge builder between Camp Yellowbird in Jamaica and um, the Bearskin Meadow. And so making sure that supplies were reaching um, places that were, um, had very little access. So I'm proud of that legacy of work. I'm happy to be here today. Thank you so much for joining us. And last but never least, my neighbor, Ms. Camila. Good morning, everyone. My name is Camila Renshaw. I am a born and raised Washingtonian. Um, I have been diabetic since I was 16 years old with a new recent diagnosis of Modi 5 since July. Um, and I'm here on this panel with all these wonderful people. So hi, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right. So, y'all, we just going to dive right on it. So, let's talk about working and living with diabetes. <clears throat> Accommodation. How many of us, or, and please, audience, jump in in the chat, raise your hand, throw those questions out there as well. But, um, those of us who work in nine to five and entrepreneurs, right? What do those accommodations look like for you? Are you, do you, are you afraid to ask for them? Does your job know that you live with this chronic illness? Like, what does that look for you in the workspace that you are currently in or a past work? Now, don't make me call on you because I know I like to call people out. <laughs> <laughs> I just started a new job last week, so I can. Oh, congratulations! All right, so I can tell you, it's contract work, which means it's going to end, unfortunately, and I don't get medical insurance. So I think that's pretty important to state because, granted, they're paying me well. I'm still not. I'm covered by the state, and because we're still in a global health pandemic, considered 
still in the health pandemic, I'm able to keep my medical insurance from Medicaid while I, while I claim. The hardest part has been like some of the small nuances, like, oh, I woke up and my pump site came out. And so I log on 35 minutes late, not because I'm slacking, but maybe because I was high. And that's really challenging because I'm remote. So I've not met and I will likely not meet anybody on my team. So I think that remote work, and I would love to hear, you know, from the rest of the panelists, like in the last couple of years, I know that's really changed. So accommodations at work had always been like, you know, we'd go out and people would try to accommodate something on the healthy side if we were going to go out, you know, that sort of stuff. Where now it's like, there really is, there's nothing unless I go to HR and have this conversation like, hey, um, I'm telling you this because I may just wake up one day and not work. <laughs> so, you know, that, that's kind of a challenge, especially if they don't know who I am, my personality, you know? So, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of my, that's kind of where I'm, where I'm at right now. You brought up something really good, um, the accommodation and a remote workspace. If anyone is a remote worker and you are navigating that, I would, I think we all would kind of love to hear about that. I'll share my experience after you guys kind of tap in and, you know, and then we can circle back. Mariah, you're in my eye view, so I'll call it. <laughs> I didn't jump in anything. Um, I, so I, a couple of things are coming to my mind. So when I was in the classroom, I always told my students that I had type one and I would teach them how to support me if I got low. So they would understand what a low blood sugar was. And then, you know, they knew that Ms. Landers needed juice, right? So um, even if the school policy was like, no, no food in the classroom, I just would create a community that understood how to care for me and then how to care for each other. So it was about building that culture. And then when I moved into administration, um, the first thing that was really hard for me was just sitting all day. And so I had to request um, a walking treadmill and they like, got a walking treadmill and then it was open for everybody. And, but that was the problem. It was open for everybody. So I didn't always have access to it when I needed to like move my body and like, you know, support my blood sugar in that way with through movement. Um, but I would just go for walks a lot. And then the other thing is that I think that learning from uh, my teaching practice about sharing, I always share like in any new environment. So I facilitate now. So I facilitate large groups of people. I just tell people up front, you're gonna see me checking my, my insulin pump, this is me. And then I'm constantly about how do we just change our cultural expectations around care and practice um, by making it okay for me to share, by making it okay for me to be vulnerable and have you understand what's happening and having me understand how, what's happening for you. Um, so those have been the adjustments for me. And then now I work for myself, I've created my own business and I work with a co-founder and that has been incredible because she understands everything. And so if I'm late, like she's got it covered. Like she understands I, you know, the, the pump fell off last night, she gets it. I don't have to like explain anything. And it's so liberating to have that. Uh, just a message someone dropped in the chat was saying that a standing desk might be good rather than sitting all day. And I have to say, I have a standing day. It is amazing. Um, Camilla, you want to jump in? Um, well, I've had kind of a bunch of different things, accommodation-wise, not accommodations, and then having some. But also, I go to school now. So having accommodations in school has been um, life-changing, because I didn't know that I could get accommodations before. So I was in school a previous time. and now having them, it's like, I'm more aware. It's like, my numbers are, I'm not feeling so great today, but they know, like my teacher knows, my professor knows, the school knows. So if something happens to me, I feel safe. Now that's definitely important. Um, for me, I do work in corporate America. Um, my accommodation from being in office to being remote, nothing changes, thank goodness, right? Like if I'm sick, I'm not coming to work. We're going, it doesn't matter if I'm home or I'm 
in the office. Uh, so thankfully, I I can say that I have had a good experience, but I would I do wish that more human resources spoke about that, regardless of if you check a box of you know being disabled or having a disability or anything like that. Like they need to let people know what those accommodations are. Um, thankfully, I do have a, a pretty good environment and my manager is really understand. I'm like, I'll send that thing. Me and Dabby, they won. I did not today. I'll talk to y'all tomorrow. So thankfully, that's what we have done. Does anyone um, in the audience, do you have anything that you might want to share about this experience? If not, we will truck along to the next question. All right. So um, I think, oh, I'm going to come back. Mariah, can you tell us about traveling and diabetes? I am very interested. I feel like I've had so many, like, story, I have story upon story. Um, <laughs> Like before 9-11, I remember just jumping on a plane with my Capri Suns and all my stuff and it was no big deal. But since then, it's like become more chaotic and as technology improves, it gets more chaotic. And um, I've just recently, like the last couple of years have been so frustrating with getting through TSA. Um, and I, so I really am just like posing a question, I think to like, what is everyone's tricks? Like I've had to like, learn tricks based off of leaving my insulin. Like I've left my insulin at TSA before. I've left all of my supplies at TSA before um, and have like gotten on the plane and gotten to my destination without insulin. So I've had to navigate, like how do I get insulin in this age where it's a lot harder um, and really finding it incredible that it's been so hard to find insulin. It took me 24 hours and all I had was the insulin in my pump. So, you know, I'm learning the little tricks now that it gets that it's even harder to travel. And I'm just wondering if people are feeling the same way. Um, and I'll just share some of my tricks are that I'm, I'm starting to set alarms. Like once I move through TSA, I set an alarm and I check it and I just have a little like reminder. Do you have everything from TSA? Um, you know, do you have like putting everything in one plastic Ziploc to go through and get hand swabbed? Um, and then making sure that my travel partners understand and do a check for me. Like, and so I'm, I'm still just navigating those and just wondering if the stories are the same out there for, for, for folks. I have done some traveling recently. Um, everything has been in state. I have done some out of the country traveling, but I hope carry a medical bag. One, I have TSA pre check. If you don't have it, I yes. think everybody gets it. Yes. Um, get it, and I'm waiting for global entry. Like, me too. Get it. <laughs> but I put everything in my in like a medical, like all of my diabetes stuff, asthma, again, everything is in a medical supply bag. I also normally I will wear something that says like I'm diabetic, and mm -hmm. it kind of like I because I don't want no problems. I mm -hmm. I don't want any problems, so I'll wear literally something that says I'm diabetic, but thankfully I have not run across anyone that is like, no, you can't come through here or give me that. Cause I feel like, take, like you can't take my medicine from me. Mm -hmm. That, that, no, we, we, nobody's fine if they take my medicine. But I, like no one, we, we all gonna sit right here, right? But no, um, they just look through my bag. I've never had them stop anything of my insulin. They stopped culture and they'll swallow that. I'm like, okay, you know, like, all right. But no, has, it looks like a lot of people have had issues there. <laughs> I just see the message. Let's look at it. Meg, you should, did you shake your head? You have problems too? Or were you just a. Oh, I was reading, I was reading, in, I read a comment here. Uh, I, it's, it's so many so many positive uh things that we want to do for ourselves when we travel like uh as mariah was saying but like you get sometimes you get there and you're at like the behest of, of that individual tsa agent i i had been i was flying back in the end of 2017 just after a wedding in september 
coincidentally, at the same time I was home, my best friend from high school and college took his own life. And I had stayed an extra week. So I services and everything. And then as I'm flying back home now, I am distraught, like not a real person in my head. I've got my insulin. I'm on the East Coast. I'm coming back to the West Coast. A TSA made me blow up. I cried right there. I like they were giving me a hard time about the ice pack. I was like, have you ever fucking seen? I was like, are you are you serious? I was like, are, is this real? I was like, let me go. Let me go. And 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 they were pushing and they were pushing. And I blew up because I was like, what is going on? What is the problem? Why don't I have some kind of pass to put in your face to say, leave me the F alone? I've been doing this for 20 years. So, and I, and I travel with a dog, so that's not easy. Um, that's also a personal choice. So I'm not saying that's, but you're, you're going through TSA. I'm taking all the stuff off my dog. He's right next to me. We go through. We got to sit on a plane. You know, talk about accommodations. That's why I fly Southwest. You know, so I personally make decisions that are best for me. But just kind of like, uh, and actually Casey, not too long ago, was down here in Denver. We get to go have lunch. Um, but I take my forerunner and sleep in the back of it with my dog in the middle of nowhere, outside of cell service. So I take my insulin, put it in the fridge, put it in the back of my truck. I just drive out into the mountains, sleep for a couple of days, take photos, clear my head, and then come back. I'm always telling Brandon where I'm going or somebody because they're like, yo, we don't know where, where are you? You know, and Brandon's like, it's funny because like we have that relationship as two guys where, you know, just friends who start this business. But he's like, I'll wake up in the morning and see some missed calls and stuff because I was like, oh, man, I guess I don't have self service. For me, I'm just clearing my head. But for other people, their concern is super high. They're always like, where is he going? What's he doing? Why is he doing that? And I think that there's a lot of questions from other people when they see you doing stuff, especially if they don't know what you're going through. So may it be a TSA agent or a family member, you know? So I feel like there's a lot of questions to answer. Um, and it could be every, it's so repetitive. TSA across the board. Because some airport TSA agents that it's fine. And then you know, you get the TSA agents where you hear stories like yours, Mariah, or yours, Matt. And then some of these in the in the comments, you know, where they're like, someone said that they needed the medical necessity form to travel international. I went to Aruba and most people didn't ask me anything. You know, like some consistency needs to to hop. Um, I think that was Casey who said, I think that was Casey put this, she put on the wallpaper on her phone, like we take all these measures. It looks like everyone takes various measures to not have to deal with any of the nonsense and yet it still happens. Um, I just want to also say like the double suspicion when you're black and diabetic or dark skin and diabetic. Like, I'm, I'm always like, ugh. like, I want the little pass, Matt, like you mentioned, I always think about that. I'm like, there should be a pass. Because it's just like the weight of that, the emotional weight of just like, would they treat someone else this way? I don't know, because this is how I'm treated in the world anyway. Yeah. And I, and to that point, like the way I go through the security as a white man, I'm like, this is like, I, I, you know, I, I don't really, I have no idea what it would be like to be a person of color and be in that situation, especially traveling with a dog, you know, or how people would even look at you in the airport to be like, what, what's wrong with you? Trust me, I get people that look at me like that. I stare at the back. Same, I don't, I don't like you, Matt, I'm, I'm team Southwest, right? And you know, yeah. Mariah, you kind of open that door on being a black woman, a person of color going through, you know, we already are, on high alert, right? Like, I don't want to make sure that I'm talking too loud because they're going to think that I'm aggressive. But I also want to talk up so you can hear me. And I know Southwest, I am at the counter gate as soon as the person comes. And I'm like, hi, I need, you know, medical pre-boarding. And it's always interesting how they look at me crazy. But then there's somebody else over here, not Black or a person of color, my age. And they're not double, you know, they don't, question and they don't look at them funny and everything and it's 
it can be frustrating. It not can be. It is frustrating. Uh, I'm trying to keep it. Sierra, hey T. I know you have something that has diabetes going through the machine. I already have my yep pump in my hand like I'm right. I even make sure I wear like clothes that I we don't you can see it like it's easy because you just want to get through like you already worried about travel. Um, does anyone I mean, I feel like me asking this question is I don't even need to ask it, but does anyone else have any any tips or something that you want to share with the group about? Travel, like how do you make it easy for yourself? What have you found for work, not for work? I think we I all found- would love. Oh, well, sorry. Hi. Uh, I found that with travel, um, if you go to like Tandem's website or Dexcom's website, they have a thing that you can print off that tells them that I can't go through this full body scanner. And you can also do, it's something else you can do to, well, like for me, I always travel with a brand new box of insulin. I'm not, I'm not like, you know, you can't say that it's fake. It has literally the prescription on it. Um, and then I also always take an extra script with me too, just in case, because I always ask my doctor for an extra one, just in case something happens while I'm traveling or I'm, I'm somewhere else. Um, and I always get to the airport at least an hour and a half early before I go through my security checkpoint, um, because I used to work for, the, I used to work at the airport in retail. So going through security, we learned just to kind of just, you know, keep it simple, sh- like chuck it down like not a whole lot and one thing they always told me was because I used to wear my next time go in and out through the magnets and they were just like just make sure you don't like put everything in your bag unless it's like a pump or your Dexcom if you have your receiver you can take that too but just make sure everything is as simple as possible just just a a tail onto that like we uh, I worked at Tandem so I used to have to answer questions from people who were calling, who would be looking to get a pump, but would also ask, oh, I travel all the time. Is this going to be a problem for me like, to go through security? And I was like, listen, I'm not a medical professional, but like, yeah, you, no. <laughs> I was like, you really shouldn't have a problem. You can always ask for a pat down. Or you can always step out of line and, and ask for special service. That's pretty much like what they're supposed to be able to do is accommodate that for you. The problem is it's, it's not always clear what that path is for them like the airport and then that's where this happens right it's like frustration now i'm stressed i'm getting on a six-hour flight guess who's angry (laughs) yeah so and crying (laughs) in the bathroom screw everybody else but like small stuff like that they don't see that they had no idea they never see me again they they whatever but like i i know that like in who you say you work in retail in the airport it's a similar experience. It's so fast paced. It's so quick. You may have memorable experiences with people, but it's not necessarily like an educational experience most of the time. Right. So there is no piece of education for anyone to be like, hey, I try like I, I've got a great looking dog who I take everything off. No collar, no vest. He sits right next to me. I got a bandana on him. He listens to me. We walk through the thing. Everyone's like, whoa i'm like yeah don't touch them don't talk to them you know but like at the same time we had to work really hard to get to that you know to that place where we felt comfortable and we're having conversations about people of color feel comfortable talking at a certain level let alone getting on a plane with 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 a service animal or going into a space that's crowded that's high traffic with an animal or assistance a cane a walker a wheelchair anything like that you know, it's super real and common. So next question in the chat that I think is really good. Um, he put, have you ever told your neighbors that you have diabetes and set a plan or something in case anything happens? Does anyone, does anybody talk to their neighbors? I think that's the first thing, right? Like, do you talk to your neighbor? And does your neighbor know anybody? No, Casey, I said no. Matt, does your neighbor know since you asked the question? All right, so I'll be real quick. So my my situation, my neighbor just left and moved, and I was really close with them, and they knew. They had my phone number. They've been in my house plenty of times. I'm friends with them, right? 
And even after six months, like I feel super comfortable. I could ask him for that. He's got to keep my house. Right. So I, I, that sort of stuff for me was they knew my situation because I explained it and kind of educated them a little bit. But they they also knew other people that had diabetes. So I, I, I just you know, if it's not necessarily maybe your exact close physical next door neighbor, having someone in your city that has maybe your Dexcom follow or is, you know, aware, not everybody has a Dexcom. I get that. Not everybody has freestyle or a way to track your insulin level or your glucose levels rather on a regular basis. I just really quick, when I was living in LA, a guy who was in New York was having severe lows who had just traveled back from LA back to New York and I had seen him and we've been friends for a while and he's low for hours and I'm calling him and I'm calling him and I'm calling him and he's not, I'm not getting a, a, anybody pick up. And I'm like, I don't know what to do. My buddy who I told I would look at his Dexcom is at urgent low for four hours. What is going on? I don't think it was, it didn't get to four hours. I started calling his parents. I called his parents. I woke his parents up at 2 a.m. I was like, look at Corey's Dexcom. And they were like, okay. I was like, hey, Mr. Zapaka, it's Matt. Look at Corey's Dexcom right now. And he was like, okay, okay, okay. They hang up with me. They call his next door neighbor whose phone number they had. And he went in and it was a compression low. It wasn't real. His blood was like a hundred something, but because he was sleeping on his Dexcom, it made it appear like that. And I always, I say that because I would say I would do exactly the same thing again. I'd call his parents and wake them up again in a heartbeat, knowing that they would want me to do that based on that relationship that him and I have. So it's tough sometimes, especially for men to get to that point where they feel like they can be vulnerable. Be like, yo, I'm not okay. Like I kind of need help. Like, can someone call me, you know? So. Yeah, no, that means. It's important. Thankfully, he has a good friend like you to be that you all have that that friendship. Um, Mariah, Camila, Camila, do you guys talk? Do you talk to your neighbors? Do they know? Uh, I'm gonna call you out this time. (laughs) Um. Well, I live at home, so I kind of have the. Uh, my brother and my mom follow my Dexcom, so it's like if I'm low, they're like, "You're low," <laughs> so that you know. But they know, you know, my family knows. We all live kind of close, so it's like if I need, like, I have supplies at everyone's houses, and you know, all that. So, you know. Ryan, I do. Um, I definitely have the Dexcom follow with a couple of friends, and then. You know, I really rely on the person that I see the most is my work partner. So if I don't show up in the morning for meetings, um, then she knows that something's wrong, but she's also on my next con follow as well. Um, what is this in the chat? Friends calling the Spain. Whoa, yeah. Not the police. Hey, you can't drop that there and not tell us about that. <laughs> um, yeah. So <laughs> Um, I was in Spain for a month and I had went out and with some friends and came back and didn't charge my phone, but I guess my blood sugar was low when it died, when my phone died. And so they were calling me, they couldn't get to me. They, uh, were calling my host family, couldn't get to them. Um, and so, yeah, I got woken up by my host mom and, uh, the Spain police and all I like I was still learning Spanish but I heard them say insulina and I was like they did not call the Spain police to come check on me (laughs) um I was okay but yeah they lost their follow privileges for like a couple weeks yeah okay um anyone else anyone else that you know I think I saw someone in the chat say that their neighbor does know it looks like Tierra said her neighbor knows that has a key to her house as well. Um, Brenna, was that your comment? I thought I saw where you said your neighbor knows. Yeah, my neighbor knows. She's also a school teacher, um, in, in, in a school next to mine, so she also knows, and we're friends, so that helps. That's good. Yeah, my 
I live, I moved back home. So my parents, my sister. Yeah, well, I live with my dad too. So, and my daughter, like they all know. So, yep, same. My sister's the only one that follows me though. And she's definitely busting the door, like, um, you know, do something about that. Um, so, but yeah, I think it's good, you know, just to have somebody to check in for you or with you. Um, all right. If anyone has read the book, How We Show Up by Mia Birdsong, it was, it was actually the diabetic community and my stories around how I get supported that really gave her the language on how to um, build communities of care. So okay. chapter two, I think is where she talks about. Oh, can you drop that name of the book in the chat form, if you don't mind? All right, y'all. I'm, I'm going to go to kind of a right, we'll, 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 question. Go ahead, Matt. I, I just think it's important that if, if anyone is listening to a recording or watching this and you don't have anything in place and there isn't something in your life, it's not too late to start or reach out to somebody. Hell, you can reach out to me. I don't care. But like you, you should there should be somebody. Just think about it. It's no, we're not we're not trying to guilt you into going to your next door neighbors with a little piece of something and being like, hi, uh, scan this code. Here's my Dexcom information. See you later. Um, because there's education behind it as well, but like there's gotta be a place to start and, and there is. So we just, it should be known that there is a starting place regardless of where you're at to get, to feel comfortable for a support around you in your own community. Definitely. Hopefully. I know I, to piggyback off you, Matt, I completely agree with you. Find someone that you're comfortable with, someone that you can trust, you have to trust them uh, to to talk to. Um, it looks like oh, a parent dropped a question or well, a comment in, and it said, "Oh man, it's moving too quick." Okay. Wait, wait, wait! It, it's relevant. It's relevant. Barbara asked. I gotta get back to it. It went way. It moved too quick for me. As a parent or a friend following it would be very helpful to know how you would like us to follow your Dexcom so we don't lose following privileges. I think to that point, that's a great, it it's really is pretty overbearing to get a lot of those notifications. So you may be on the receiving end and just want to shut it down because you're like, uh-uh, I'm not doing, how many lows do you have a day, bro? Like, I'm, I'm shutting this down, come on, you know? So for some people that don't have diabetes, they don't understand that's every day. But yeah, mm -hmm. this is our every day. Like this is how it goes. Welcome. So right. as a as a parent, I don't know, Casey, you want you want to chime in there and say, like, what would you rather have had them do to not lose their privileges? Because I'm more on the side of like, they're showing up. They're coming. They're coming to the house. They're gonna be there. And it's because we have given that lifeline, that extension for them to do that. So I think it's like if I have somebody on my Dexcom follow, I'm expecting them or asking them to reach out if they see something that's like. Yeah, no. So honestly, I think right now, as I've gotten older, like I very much appreciate what they did. And I think they did everything right um, because they couldn't get a hold of me. They couldn't get a hold of my professors. They couldn't get a hold of my host family. So at the end of it, that was who they could get a hold of. Um, and so in the moment I was a college, like kid just upset at like all that attention on me. Um, and so I, did at the end of it, like talk to them. And, um, so now if I'm low, like I'll just send like a smiley face to my mom or something like letting her know, like I am treating or whatever. Um, just making sure there is like communication going on. Um, but in that instance, 100%, like they did everything that I would have wanted them to do. That makes a lot of sense. So, um, our time, unfortunately, is definitely dwindling down. But I have two really good questions that I really want to get out um, before we have to end our session. One is, how do you navigate the fear of diabetes after diagnosis? Come in. I'm, I'm going to just start with you this time. Um, for a long time, I feel like I didn't, I didn't, I just didn't deal with it. It was like, okay, I'm diagnosed, but I also came from having a parent who was diagnosed. 
and have a lot of, and you know all the my paternal side you know like understanding like all these people have had diabetes they've all you know had complications at a really young age and like sitting with that was um fearful and I think that and I've told this before I've told this before I've told this to Kai before like I want to say at least twice um I saw her video she did about her own self-advocacy and that kind of set me on a journey of um not being fearful and so I feel like I've been living more uh, because I'm understanding that I am a person with diabetes, not just a diabetic. Well said, fine, well. Uh, Matt. Hi, she has that effect on people. She just be turning, you know, turn. Did you see her face? She was like, I did what? No, you were just being you, like. <laughs> Um, I would actually ask Camila, like you said, you just got a new diagnosis, right? Like I, if you like, well, I know in, in the screen, you're next to your Modi five friend, Rena, right there. Um, could you, I don't know if you guys are familiar that you both have Modi five, but that's a new diagnosis, Camila. C could you answer that question based on that recent diagnosis? Like what, what, what happened there for you? Like mentally, like, what was that? Um, it was like, if I, cause I told my doctors a long time ago that I thought my diabetes was not normal. Like I would go from being at 300 or 400 to, I would drop down to the forties within maybe an hour or two. And it just was not, it wasn't working. Um, and so I left, I left this one doctor's office, started going to a new one and they finally decided to do genetic testing. Um, my father was a dialysis patient, legally blind, amputee, like all the things. And if they had listened to me, they would have, they would have caught it and they could have tested him too, to figure out a treatment plan. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, finding that out, and I found this out in July, uh, and I also started my pump <laughs> in July. Um, so it's been a, it's, it's been a new experience. Like I have to feel like I have a little bit more freedom. It's, it's nice to know, not just have something up in the air. So I think that for me, it's like, I'm learning to live with this and knowing that this is a part of me, but it's not all of me. I would like Rena, because Rena had a very similar experience. I don't know if you all have met, have met each other, but Rena joined the Polish Maximus calls, uh, pretty much for the last two years as we did them. And uh, we learned a lot about what she was going through, but sharing some of those personal experiences and journeys. Um, yeah, it's, it's great to, for you two to, to meet each other. Well, yeah, Camila, we'll, 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 definitely, we'll definitely chat. Yeah, because I was first diagnosed with type one for about three of the years. And then later, after things weren't quite lining up, we realized that it was uh, genetic Modi 5. So. We will definitely chat and I can share some information because I know what it is to switch diagnoses mid midstream. Please do, because there's not a lot out there. So please no, do. No, it's not. But I, I have some other Modi friends in the community that I made, you know, since then. So we'll definitely. You can get my information. I'll talk to you. Thank yeah, you. That's the power of community. That is the power of community right there. Um, Mariah, you, if I need to repeat the question, let me know. But um, if you're good, we can repeat. Um, it was about how we felt during diagnosis. Yeah, how did you navigate the fear of diabetes after your diagnosis? Um, you know, when I was diagnosed, I had a, I live, I have a single parent, and I have another sibling that has even more issues than me, she's um, developmentally delayed. So when I was diagnosed, I really had to just take everything on, on my own. Um, and so my saving grace was summer camp. I think the smartest thing my mom ever did was just get me into camp right away. And I, I don't know, I think it set me straight and I just, yeah. I, but I've had to navigate like the conditions of like taking on diabetes as a child alone. And I think it's led to a lot of um, anxiety as an adult that I think I'm just recently starting to understand how that has impacted my life and how um, like using therapy, like cognitive behavioral therapy has like really stopped a lot of the 
cycles of anxiety that I get from like just being hyper vigilant about my care. Um, you know, things that I just had to deal with. Thank you for that. You know, I know this experience was definitely different when you were diagnosed as a child, you know, versus being diagnosed at the other stage in life. So thank you for for your point of view. Um, or anyone in the audience, would you like to chime in about how you navigated the fear of diabetes, or if there was no fear um, after your diagnosis? I'm a, I'm definitely gonna say I think it's something I've realized and I've thought about a lot. But I think as a white male, my privilege. My father was a doctor, and my mother my mother was a nurse. My just general privilege kind of eliminated a lot of the fear in the beginning because my parents went away to Las Vegas. They came home and in like six days, I'd lost like almost 15 pounds. Like my body was like, right? No nutrients, nothing. I was pale, more pale than this. And, and they, were, they noticed something was wrong right away. They go, don't eat in the morning. We're going to take you. They knew. And then that care of like how to take care of somebody like that in the future. My, my father was a doctor for 40 years. My mother was a recovery room nurse, she worked in the allergy room. So like for me, I was literally, I felt like I was in a medical facility. So because of, because of how I grew up, it was almost like it's just this other thing. And then I got to be an adult. Like I've lost my parents, a lot of family members, friends. And it's like, once you're on your own, I was like, man, but for a lot of people, that experience happens immediately. And it didn't happen for me for, for years afterwards because it was, it was almost sheltered from what that really like, we had insulin, I never worried about it, you know, like that sort of stuff. We're now at 36 years old. I can tell you that I, before I got on Medicaid just a couple months ago, I ran out of insulin and I got Medicaid approved the day I needed to go get insulin. So, drastically different experiences. I'm very thankful for both, but I'm, I'm more attached to my latter experiences, knowing that that's what more people experience. And, and, and even like, it's more of like a half-assed, like it's not even real for a lot of people. I stand behind them in, their, in the store, in the, you know, watch their interactions. And it's like, there's lack of education and stuff. So yeah, so I think it, it really, it's you know, the people around you, but I, I have learned through the last couple of years, speaking with Brandon, uh, as much as we have, um, I've talked a lot to Kai, what's up T, um, you know, Kiyomi, like a, a couple individuals in here, we've had a lot of conversations about where, you know, coming from one place and ending up in another and realizing like, this is the reality. Like more people live like this than anything else, anywhere else in the world. And, and it's, it's shocking. Um, hey, friend. Yeah, it definitely is. Um, which kind of walks us on. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so, my one of my next questions, which is, how can we do a better job in educating and showing living with diabetes daily? Because there are a lot of assumptions that walk around this world when you hear the word diabetes, right? Like, and it's based on race, age, weight, height, everything, right? You know, I guess I'm a black woman and people automatically assume that I've struggled and knock on every wood around me, I've never had to struggle, right? And so we just, those things, you know, like we don't take away from anyone else, but we also want people who have not had those experiences to still step up and share because all stories need to be told, right? People need to know that there is some good to diabetes, right? Like look at us here, we go to community. You know, we have lifelong friends. We've made best friends in this community. You know, Meg, you have Brandon, I have Tierra and Emil. You know, people, the community is a plus. And so how can we do a better job? What are your thoughts on doing a better job? Anybody? I think there needs to be more of a baseline for education because I feel like sometimes within the diabetes community it's very separate it's like oh you have type one and there's like 
only this amount of information out there or oh you have type two or there's no like you need to look out for these signs and symptoms or um like this year i just learned what pre bolusing was after 12 years i mean like literally like they were like oh you've been taking your medication wrong for the last five years i'm like i literally followed what the directions what you've told me and they're like oh you, this is what needs this needs to be pre bolus knowing that information and knowing the terminology is super important. And that's one thing that I feel like it's lacking in diabetes education. And I feel like, especially for, I guess, in the community that I'm in, it's not even talked about. It's not discussed. It's not explained. They just hand you a prescription and tell you to take this without explaining to you all the symptoms, all the reactions you can have. So just but how to navigate situational aware, like your own situational awareness, but like you get into the situation and you're like, I don't know, I'm confused. What is going on? You know, it's like, you think you're supposed to be doing X, like you said, and then they turn around and they go, no, 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 no. It's all this. And you're like, I've been doing, I've been in this situation and I've been aware of what I've been doing, but because no one ever made that connection, like, how was I supposed to? So, yeah. What's up, Kai? Is it me? Did I do that? I hope it was not. <laughs> no, you are. <laughs> Casey, was that you? Were you trying to make sure we were woke? <laughs> that was not me. I was surprised too. I was like, guilty. Sorry. Oh, I wish I. Was like, Wait, <laughs> no, Matt, you, you are. Those were some really, really good points, right? That people need to realize that diabetes is not one size fits all. So don't give me one way to handle. Give me options. You know, like tell me. You know, like, say, hey, pre bolus might work. It also might not work for you because there are people that it doesn't work. Right. You know, like they need to do all of it. Like give us all of it and not just a little smidgen or no smidgen at all. Mariah. Yeah, I'll, I'll just also add that I do think there are discriminatory practices around education because I have noticed that my counterparts that are white, my white peers with diabetes will come with information that I've like, I'm not getting this. I don't know if it's my provider. I don't know what, but I'm really thankful that I'm tapped into a community, but I have to make sure that I'm constantly tapping in to get that info. Um, and so that's also an exhaustive, like, you know, emotional cost. But one thing that I practice in, in the design of my business is like reparations because as a black person and reparations as a type one in that my business partner, um, I own more of the company and then all of my medical is paid for. And so I have um, I've built in and she's agreed to, she's a white bodied woman. She's agreed to, you know, practicing this with me and making sure that I am cared for um, as someone in the world in a society that really doesn't show care at large. That's that's amazing. Thank you for giving me all of that. That is more for me. Um, I know when I was diagnosed as a type, the information that I got once I was correctly diagnosed, they had they needed to do it way better. Right, like I, it was, I got a plus of information when once I was told that I was type one, and it shouldn't be like that because there are a lot of common things amongst all the types and give us all of that information. Hannah, go ahead. I see your hand raised. Hi all. Um, yeah, I mean, all great points. Uh, I feel like something that we already have, like in this conference, is continuing to build these like support groups and social circles with like other diabetics and people who take insulin. I think that's like really important. I got it when I was nine and I, I knew like a few people in school who had it, but I never really had a friend who had it. I didn't know there were any diabetes camps. I didn't know that existed until like way later. Um, and I just, it felt really isolating. So I've had a lot of issues over the years, like fully even accepting it, which also affects how you take care of yourself and you get into burnout and things like that. So I think 
having like a good support system and conferences like this or just opportunities for us to talk about the experiences we went through and the things we went through are really critical to also um, like managing it because it's a lot. And you know, your loved ones who don't have it, they wanna help and they are helpful, but it's different when they don't get the day-to-day, out-hour, minute-to-minute struggle. Um, that's my take away. No, thank you for sharing with uh, for sharing your experience. You made some really valid points. It's definitely hard in this adult, right? Um, does anyone else, would anyone else like to share anything? No? All right. So, guys, and don't make me call you up. I'm going to call you What is something that you know now? that you wish you would have knew earlier in adulthood about living with one home. Think on it. Audience, you guys think on it too. But don't take too long. <laughs> I think of that. That was an answer to the last question too. It was just that I think about art a lot. No. Yeah. yeah. You know what? To pitch a Netflix show, you have to have a producer or writer who's worked with Netflix before. I got one of those connections. Let's go. Go ahead, man. Let's start writing. I'm there. So I so what I what I like to do is travel like a hundred thousand miles with my dog. We've been to 20 national parks, but like we educate people when we go in there. We talk about what it is that my dog does for me that I don't but um educating the public at large is such a major undertaking. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I love what you said about camp before. I've got this photo here. I feel like it's important for me to share. Um, I, I, I didn't say anything about how I navigated my diagnosis. Right after I was diagnosed, really, because it was kind of blanketed, the community is what I learned from the most. And it was through camp because I, I went and I, I ended up being a camp counselor, a camp director for young kids with diabetes. Um, we, we had, we made teepees and we colored all over the teepees and we had a lot of kids that were six, seven years old that didn't want to be there. And so was, there was this one kid who, uh, was very much not interested in, in kind of hanging out, but I kind of made it my point to be like, find out why. And then ultimately you know, at the night he wanted to go home and everything. I let him like color all over me, like with markers and stuff. And like, that's like small stuff like that. He didn't go home. He went back to bed. <laughs> like, no. um, unfortunately, that young man passed away this year. He was 22 years old. But this is a photo of him and I uh, at camp when he was a young kid. And so I do not know the cause of his, his passing, uh, but it was very shocking. He was a bright young man with a, with a great future, but he was the only kid of color at the camp, and he was in the, he was adopted by a white family, and it, and it I you know hadn't spoken to him much in the last couple of years, but every year at camp like that was my guy, you know like we were always like, so it's small stuff like that that I recognize like it may not have been education it may it may not have been any you know it may not have been anything that anybody could have done, so the one thing about diabetes is sometimes we think that we can help control things in other people's lives and it's it's out of our reach sometimes so if you are attempting to help somebody do your best but understand that like not everybody is going to accept it it is great to put and push that, that help in someone's court but they, they may just not accept it and so it's important to understand that as, as much as you want to help other people um, help yourself first and then move on to other people. I, I, I have nothing else to say. And you know, you know me, y'all know that that's that's not normal, right? right? I'm always ready to talk about something. But no, Matt, thank you for sharing that. I think it, you know, people that are diagnosed as children, they have that cat, or we would think that they know about the cat, right? But us as adults, we don't have that option. Our only option is community, right? Like we're diagnosed as adults at 
the only cat that I know of is that one that's outside hiking or whatever that is. And that's not my lane, right? Like, so I'm not going to that, uh, which is why it was really big for like, for us to push dope diabetic girls, for us to join things like the support group called that diversity and diabetes coach, because we don't have cats so we can't meet people. Plus, you know, in, in adulthood, it's not as easy. Like kids will walk up to you and start talking about anything. Whereas an adult, you know, you're more protected about your space and things like that. So it, it, the community is definitely everything. I know for me, it was everything. Um, I wish I knew I had other people in my community at 16. Yeah, see, I, I was a grown you know, 29 looking for people, you know, our age. Camilla, I think your experience is similar to mine, you know, in adulthood finding, finding friends, right? But no, okay, so guys, tell us something that you know now about diabetes that you wish you would have known earlier in adulthood. Y'all had time to think about it, so let's talk about it. Go ahead, Camilla. Um, I'm going to say that I didn't understand how much of an emotional connection it is to your physical, like your, like, like my physical body. Like I didn't realize like my lows make me really confused and I feel that confusion. Like, and it takes a minute to rally, but it's like understanding, like I, and I get upset because I go low or I get upset because I go high or I get ex upset because I'm not in range. So it's like understanding the, the emotional aspect. I wish I had understood that earlier. That's, that's, that's good. Mariah. I don't know, honestly. I think maybe the only thing that's coming to me is um, understanding all of the skills that it takes to manage your own diabetes is applied to everywhere else in the world and to not just like minimize it towards this is what it means for me and my body, but it's also an extension of like how you can be in the world and what the world needs, right? And so I think to consider what might feel like hard parts as these incredible strengths and skills that also apply outside oh, of my diabetes care. I'm sorry, sorry, yeah, I thought you were done, I'm so sorry. That's it, that's it. And I, it's probably also a little different for you too being diagnosed, right? as a child and then already kind of having routines and things like that put in place for you. So I, I kind of can see the difference there. Man, what about you, my guy? Um, it's okay to have bad days. And I like diet my, my, <laughs> specific diet i probably would have pushed if i could go back and like talk to my i'd push myself to be plant-based uh sooner or be more conscious of of how much and what i was putting in my body um because even even in your like for your own i'm like oh i used to do this before and this is what happened and it's like six months later i do that same thing and now this happens so I'm, I was diagnosed with gastroparesis, undiagnosed, uh, diagnosed again, you know, like kind of back and forth. Um, but definitely it's okay to have bad days. And, and <laughs> eat as much of the non-carb stuff as you want. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I don't really eat cheese anymore, but I'm, you know, that's why I like like some vegetables and stuff where I like non-starchy vegetables load up on those. But I, I don't know, like I, I to Camila's point, like there's a an, an extreme emotional connection that I was unaware of. And I went through breakups, I went through, I lost jobs, I lost family members, my parents. I went through stuff where I was like, oh, food. <laughs> and so that's been an outlet for me. But um knowing that like to get into a better regiment sooner would be would have been great. Casey, now I know you're not really a part of like this specific panel, but what if what, what about you? What what do you wish you have known? You know, you know now you wish you would have known then. Well, so 
like Mariah, I was diagnosed as a kid as well. And um, I resonate with what Matt said, how like recognizing that things you did six months ago, like they're not going to work now. Um, and so as I like transition, like I graduated college two years ago. And so like, I'm now figuring out like, okay, well, I'm not walking on campus every day. Like I'm sitting at a desk. And so that is a huge impact than what I knew it would be. Um, and so understanding I, my regimen or whatever I'm doing, my diabetes uh, care is going to be a little bit different to where like I have to make sure I go like move my body when I get home and or go work out before I go work and uh, just kind of tweaking things like because I was very fixated on like no like I have always done this like I've never needed to do this before like but realizing that like as I get older like my body's going to change and my needs are going to change and that's just the same for everyone, even if they don't have diabetes. I think also like recognizing that, like, I always thought like, oh, like if this is happening, it's because of my diabetes and oh no, like poor me. But I mean, I am also just a human going through human things too. And sometimes not everything's associated with diabetes. So I think that's like a, a huge, like mental thing I had to go through. Anyone in the audience, what about you guys? Does anyone want to share what they know now that they wish they would have known or any adult? Yep. All right. All right. We can keep moving. I and mean, if you guys have questions about anything else, if there is something else that you want to mention or bring up, we are absolutely happy to touch on those topics, conversations, and anything as well. Um, this was something that I meant to ask earlier, and I'm glad that I talked about that. Um, tip, does anyone have tips? But I guess this one will be more for those diagnosed earlier in life when they were still on their parents and sharp. What is that transition? Do you have any tips to give people that might be in that space now or parents that have kids that might be getting ready to transition off of their Paris insurance. Um, can you speak to that? Go ahead. Don't, don't let your insurance lapse. Whatever you do, don't let it lapse. Cause when that 20, what is it? I think it's 26. When that 26 hits, I was on some good insurance <laughs> through my mom's school, through my mom's job. Um, and then I, one day I went to go pick up my meds from the pharmacy and I didn't know that it had, it had already hit like it, like do not let your insurance lapse. Cause it's more difficult to, it's more difficult to get it again. Like starting over as yourself than it is to like transfer over to another plan. Just don't let that policy lapse. I think the one thing that I'm now, I I was not on my parents' insurance when I was diagnosed. However, I will say this. Parents, start talking to your children before 26. Start getting them involved and included and understand. Uh, when I say to adults, talk to the human resources. Please talk to your benefits team. While it is amazing to talk to the community, Plans vary with your job, and those people are trained to answer those questions. I don't care how many of them you have, ask them, all of them. Even if you have to call them back, I, I can't stress that one enough. Talk to them, ask them, do they cover this pump? How much is this insulin? Like, ask them all of those questions so you aren't shocked later on in the year. Ask those questions. And parents, start talking to your kids when they're like 24, 25. Get up there and talk to them because they really need to understand how insurance works. Especially here in the States, we really need to destigmatize Medicaid. Like, I, I think, I'm going to introduce somebody because he, he's been sitting in my living room. He came in to help me with this <laughs> show last night. He's got a sweet hat on. It says insulin. This hey, is guys. David. David Powers, he's from LA, but we were just having a conversation. David just quit his job. 
Didn't you, David? Yeah, I did. Yeah. You're paying for insurance? Yeah, I'm still paying. Out. I was paying out of pocket the entire time. I said, cut that shit out yeah. and apply for Medicaid right now. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I said, apply for Medicaid. I go, you don't, you're not, you got to, that's, I went and picked up my insulin. I paid like a couple dollars, you know? So it's stuff like that. And he just came out here to help me with the show that I did last night. But also like having that conversation is, it, I don't know, it's challenging because it's two guys. You're like, no, I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. But there's this like vulnerability. It's like, well, you know, it's, it's okay to not be okay. You know, not that you're not okay. Yeah. But <laughs> like saying that like in soon, you're going to run out of money if you're paying a couple hundred dollars to a marketplace for insurance, where ultimately if you're not making income, the state should be covering you. Please, please consider learning about it, looking it up. We've got some information. We've had these conversations with Krisha before. Um, I know we recorded uh, last year, we talked about it. Um, we can make some of those available. It's super important to know that there are options out there for low income, for people who are impacted. He wants to do something other than what he's doing. Live your life, bro. Yeah. But also like make sure you get insulin. <laughs> so, so yeah. So I, I had to introduce everybody to <laughs> Hey guys. Hi. Uh, Barbara brought this in the chat, and I stand by this as well. When you are considering your job, don't just consider that salary. Know those benefits. At, oh, I don't know what I This chat is moving real quick. Um, know about the benefits. Like, ask those questions. Ask the question. That is what that benefits team is there to do to help. Like Matt said, spoke on Medicaid, you know, find out your state, know it for your state, because while it's great that we share these tips amongst us all, what works in California doesn't work in Maryland, doesn't work in D.C., doesn't work in Virginia, and everywhere else that people are living. So talk to, talk to the experts and let those experts do their job, because that's what they get paid to do their job. Um, does anyone else? Yes, go ma'am. Yes. Um, I'll just, so I think, you know, times are changing, but a part of, to Barbara's point and to Matt's point, a part of my adulting was choosing a job where I would have insurance. And it wasn't a job that I really wanted to do. I didn't want to go into teaching. I wanted to be an artist, but there was no pathway for insurance in that route. And so I think I, I did hold like a lot of resentment around with for diabetes by not being able to choose like my dream. And what I've been able to do is scope out a world in the arts anyway, um, through the field of education, but there was a loss for me because at that time, um, there, there were just not things in place that would have been supportive for um, me to elect my dream and not, you know, I wouldn't have insurance. So I do think things are changing, which I'm so grateful to see people able to make choices about what they wanna do. Um, and I think that it's really important that we all are aware of the policies that people are building and putting into place. I feel very lucky to live in California where we do have covered California, right? And we do have like millions of dollars going into manufacturing our own insulin. And so I think it's really important that we are politically driven and like driving choices, like help build policy, get, you know, be a part of the brain trusts that are around how we are shaping our government and because um, it, it impacts our lives. Yes, we do. Does anyone else have anything that they would like to add? Do you guys have any questions for the lovely people on the panel? I feel the job restriction. Adulting, man, it's hard, right? <laughs> Adulting is like, it, it, it's, it's definitely hard. Um, well, I want to thank you guys for coming, you know, opening up your Saturday some earlier than others um, to hope to come and hold this conversation that honestly could continue to go on because adulting and diabetes right is it's everything it's every decision that we make family job and like literally everything that we do we think about it. 
Um, it's, it's, it's what we are, how we maneuver things. Um, so, if you guys want to just tell the people, and I'll start with Matt again since he's outnumbered, you know, where they can find you, where they can connect with you. Yeah. First of all, thank you to Mariah and Mila for sharing uh, some of, of your experience. Kyleen, again, for hosting, doing a smash job. Um, like we, we really appreciate you coming in and, and managing you know, that conversation because it is so challenging, right? We could talk for hours and I know we have in the past. Um, you can find me, it's just my name, Matt.Taro or I'm Bolus Maximus or look up Brandon A. Denson if you haven't, check him out. Uh, David Powers as well. We're, we're you know, raising awareness, but at the same time, you know, just real people connecting. So if anybody needs anything, please feel free to reach out, especially if you know a male, uh, somebody in your life that lives with diabetes, that's not doing all right. Like it may not look like they're not doing okay. Um, so we definitely are, are looking to help people, specifically people of color, um, and, and understanding that that there's a long road. So um, thank you most specifically to Quisha and Casey for putting this together. Uh, yet again, what a wonderful uh, conversation. Thank you. Mariah. Ditto echo on that gratitude and appreciation. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Camila. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Casey. Um, I you can find me on studiopathways.org and Mariah Rankin Landers on Insta. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm 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 a resource, happy to be a resource and happy to support um, as needed and really grateful for this community. This is one of the things that I've wanted for a long time so when this started to come up Casey you know like it's been just such a pleasure to know that this exists in the world thank you oh me oh um <laughs> um I'm my social media is just at killer cams uh I'm under a social media rebrand at the moment um but I also want to say thank you to all the panel people. I've learned so much. Matt, Kyleen, Mariah. Uh, thank you, Casey, for pushing me to do this. Thank you, Quisha, for uh, help, and Casey for helping create this space for um, creating this safe space. So I'm thankful and I'm grateful for everyone. And yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Mean, I mean, here, I can absolutely be found on Black Diabetic Girl. I can be found under Dope Diabetic Girl. We are a group of women who stand on sisterhood and building that friendship. We do very similar work to both Blackfellas. If you have put us together, you know the fun that we have because this, this living with this disease can be taxing. And so building that support system and those friendships and sisterhood and brotherhood are extremely important and providing a safe space. One of my partners in crime from Dope Diabetic Girls is here, Pierre. Um, if you have not caught the monthly chat that Diversity and Diabetes puts on the fourth Wednesday of every month, you have done yourself a disservice because we have a grand time and you have, I think, two or three more months to catch us. So mm -hmm. come on, this November and December. Uh, Quisha, Casey, you know, thank you always for providing this space for us to build community, to educate ourselves. And more importantly, to educate those that don't live with this disease or what we live with daily, right? So thank you guys for that. And I'm turning it over to you guys. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you all so much. Um, I love the conversation. I think it's so useful to hear just how people are navigating, like getting older with diabetes, you know, for us who are diagnosed at a younger age, like that focuses on us so much, but like we get older and we need help. So just hearing about like people's experience is always so helpful. So thank you all so much. Um, well, if there are no more questions, we're going to wrap up this session. Uh, so join us um, at 
12 um, 11 30 at the next session um we'll be starting soon so take a quick break uh, stretch your legs and come right back so see y'all soon bye y'all